Welcome to the freshman presentation for the 2021 uh, class of TJ admissions. My name is Jeremy Sugar. I'm the director of admissions. Uh, and along with me today is Linda Sperling, our admissions specialist. And we wanted to welcome you to that process uh, so that we can share a little bit of information about the TJ admissions, the school or TJ admissions process along with the school, uh, the process. Uh, we wanted to make sure uh, that we share with you the steps for the application, the writing components, uh, the selection process, and then the calendar of events. And at the end, we have some frequently asked questions that get asked of us, and so we wanted to be able to provide some of those responses to you. Uh, Linda, can you uh, share a little bit about us and, and kind of tell us really what is starting us and, and what's the important parts of, of TJ or Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology? Absolutely. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, as you will see here, the mission of Thomas Jefferson High School has a focus in three areas. It is to provide students a challenging learning environment, to inspire joy at the prospect of discovery, and to foster a culture of innovation. If you've been fortunate enough, as we have, to be in the school and to see the students in this environment, you can see that, in fact, they are perfectly placed uh, in an environment where they truly are thriving. Also, this gives you an idea of the scope of where TJ is located. It is just off of I-495 in Fairfax County, on Braddock, off of Braddock Road, between Backlick and Little River Turnpike. You can also see that our participating jurisdictions uh, in the process are located on this map also. What makes TJ different? Well, TJ is a regional governor school. And what that means is every year, school boards of education have an opportunity to vote whether or not they will send their students to TJ. We currently have five participating jurisdictions. They are, of course, Fairfax County, Loudoun, Arlington, Prince William, and the city of Falls Church. Also, what makes it different in our base high schools, you live within a geographical area and you register at your school. For TJ, there is an admissions process. All of the courses beginning in ninth grade are taught in advanced level. And there's research-based learning that also begins in ninth grade, which continues through all four years at the school. The core curriculum piece for ninth grade, ninth graders, is IBET. It's Integrated Biology, English, and Technology. And it's three block classes that are together. What this allows for is flexible class time, expanded class time for classes uh, as demands. For example, in this, in this slide, uh, the young lady on the left, they are out on a biology field trip. By doing this during these, this three block window of IBET, um, they are not taking time away from any of their other core classes in their curriculum. On the right-hand side, you will notice these robots that the students make in their technology class over the course of the year. And then at the end of the year, they have different types of um, competitions between the IBET classes with these robots. The STEM, the research-based STEM learning um, continues through the sophomore and junior years, and also as does the connected class time. There are double blocks that um, continue in sophomore year and junior year. Ultimately, it's leading up to the end of your junior year, the students select a topic that they will research for their senior research lab. On site, Thomas Jefferson has all of these laboratories that are available for the students. And most likely, the topic that they have selected will be placed in one of, they will be placed in one of these labs. However, it's also possible that they may pick a topic that doesn't, isn't covered by one of these laboratories. So in fact, they will be a part of a mentorship program where someone from some of the corporations that you see listed here may either come into TJ for them or they may in fact have an opportunity to go to those corporations. In other words, they try and fit the needs of all of those um, senior students in their research lab. Uh, so Linda, in a situation like that, is, is the research that um, the students do, is that something that the, the lab directors or the school kind of prescribes to the student or uh, how's that function? That's how's a that really work? good question, Jeremy. No, the students, they come up with their proposal 
for their research lab. And what's really wonderful about the, the research labs is during the course of the past years that Jeremy and I have been in, this, in these positions, um, the school actually has changed some of those labs. So the students have come to uh, the administration and they've said, you know, this isn't so much the cutting edge lab anymore. So would you consider this? And in fact, they do. So those labs change. And so the students really do have an input to keep the school on the cutting edge when it comes to the, to the senior research laboratories. Right, and I think it's important to, to know that this is kind of driven, as Linda's sharing, it's really driven by what the students are interested in. And as you saw from the different um, research lab opportunities, students have been able to engage in a variety of different ways and find out. Um, but but TJ is more than just the research that happens within the school. Uh, it is a public high school, and so it offers a complete, uh, a, a complete curriculum for uh, the students uh, in terms of uh, all students have English, uh, they have history, the same core classes that they would at any other high school. But beyond that, they also have plenty of elective offerings uh, between the fine and performing arts. They have the world language opportunities uh, that are available to them. And I think it's important to recognize and realize as they, they go throughout their four years of learning at the school, in many ways, it's just like any other high school in that aspect. Uh, and so that's really not a lot different. But one of the things that does make a difference for TJ uh, that we've seen from other schools is the eighth period class, or, the, or what we just call eighth period. Now eighth period only happens twice a week. It happens um, traditionally on Wednesdays and Friday afternoons. It's the last period of the day. And in this particular class, what you have is it's, an, it's a built-in intentional activities period during the school day. Um, so this allows students to engage. One of the things we recognized, or at least TJ recognized early on, is students are coming from a large geographic footprint. It isn't necessarily the neighborhood school as a, as a normal high school would be. And because of that, many activities at your normal high schools, or your traditional base high schools, if you will, uh, those activities and clubs and events happen after the school day. And so they're able to uh, find an easier way to be able to go home. In this environment, that's probably not as easy for many of our students. And so it was built into the school day so students have an opportunity to engage in um, a wide variety of clubs and activities. I think last year there was almost 200 different clubs mm -hmm. and activities available to our students. And in some cases, students are making up new clubs and activities as they go throughout the four years. And they're able to engage in multiple as they go throughout the year. They don't always meet every Wednesday or every um, Friday. Beyond that, students have a wide variety of extracurricular activities available to them. Um, they have a full range of high school sports. So all of the same high school athletics that you would find at uh, any of your other high schools in Fairfax County are available at TJ, uh, ranging from your varsity to your ju junior varsity as well as your freshman um, sports. But they have beyond that as well. So those students that want to perform on the stage or they want to, to, um, to sing or they want to be in the band, um, you know, all of those options are available to TJ students. So in many ways, TJ is like any other high school. And that's important to note that students aren't sacrificing or giving up those dreams and desires and things that they like to do uh, just because they want to go to a school that has a high level of STEM focus in science and technology as a part of that process. So as we go through this, and you're thinking about this might be a school for me, this might be something that I'm really interested in, what are you looking for in a student? Well, what we're looking for is evidence of academic achievement in the school. And we're looking at um, students who have demonstrated sincere and genuine interest and curiosity in STEM. What we really want to make sure uh, that they can do is that um, from the academic achievement um, aspect of it is that they, they really are, uh, we're looking at GPA, we're looking at grades. How well were you performing in school? Uh, and we're looking at your seventh grade uh, and your for, in the beginning of eighth grade. Because at, at this point in time at the middle school level, that's really what we have. Uh, and how we calculate that or how we, we monitor that is your GPA and what courses you're enrolled in. 
uh, and how we monitor in terms of your interest, your curiosity, your passion, those come out in the student portrait sheet and the problem solving essay, and we're gonna talk about that in just a moment. But parents, what I really want you to think about, and students is what I want you to think about as well, is the questions that are here. You know, what about STEM are you interested in, and why? What is it that you've done to pursue this interest? What haven't you done? What could you do? What have you learned? Why is that important? Why TJ? Parents, after you're done watching this session, uh, maybe what you wanna do is have that conversation with your son or your daughter. And, and, and kids, this would be important for you to realize and think about what it is that you really want to pursue. Uh, we've offered and provided you a great deal of information and opportunities to consider, um, but what we want you to think about and start to think about is why TJ and answer these questions. So Linda, can you tell us a little bit more about the eligibility requirements as we go through that process? Absolutely, Jeremy. Uh, first of all, you must be in eighth grade to apply to ninth grade. You must reside in one of those participating school divisions that we talked about earlier. As you will notice here, it also says honors algebra one or higher in eighth grade along with honors science and one additional course. We do know that many of our public schools as well as some of our private schools do not offer honors courses in some areas. Uh, this is a new aspect of the admissions process and so there will be waivers that um, are being looked at as being available because we know that students as eighth graders now, you actually selected your courses a year ago at the same time. So in order to give you an opportunity uh, to move forward with the process, um, we are looking at those waivers. Also, the 3.5 GPA, as Jeremy just referred to, end of seventh grade, beginning of eighth grade. Your seventh grade final marks um, are worth one credit each in the core subjects of English, science, math, and social studies, as well as a world language if it's taken for high school credit. Your eighth grade first quarter marks in those same courses are worth a quarter point. And that's what we use when we calculate um, the GPA based upon a 4.0 scale. That is the FCPS scale. I think that pretty much takes us through the, the eligibility requirements. Everyone we know has been monitoring our website because we've asked them to for updates. Here you will see is the uh, the page, the first of all, the link to our page. You go there and this is what you will see at the top of the page, the admissions page. Um, so this is what you're going to look for as you move forward for the applica actual ap application. As you scroll down the page, you will see steps for application. Now, what makes this unique is that the applicant must access the login screen and sign in first. Um, there's a reason for this. The applicant is going to enter minimal information, uh, including a parent's name and email address. Then they literally will hit the Save button. Once they do that, then the parent receives an auto-generated email that contains the link for them to log in and create the parent account. Now, not only has an email gone out to the parent, but that applicant's name now appears on the applicant list in the middle school in which they attend. We have, we have over 120 school contacts for public schools and private schools and it is their role to go in and be the gatekeeper of the math course for us. So they are the, going to be the ones who, who log in to their applicant list and they're going to say this student, and they're going to enter it in, the app, in their portal, that this student is enrolled in Algebra One or Geometry, whatever the course will be. Once they've entered that in, and we do ask that you allow the counselors a day or two to do this, they are very busy people now as counselors, and this is an added task for them. So give them a couple of days, they will go in, they will verify the math. Once they save the math, here again the student and the parent will receive auto-generated emails, which will tell them then they may move forward to complete the application. Um, continuing on in the steps, 
Uh, part of the process is both the applicant and the parent must electronically sign. You must complete the zero fee verification. There's no longer a fee for this process, but you still must go through a process to verify that zero fee. And then submit the application. Once again, once you have submitted, there will be another auto-generated email that will go to the applicant and parent advising them that in fact the application has been submitted. Once you, once you have logged into the application, you will see a tab at the top that talks about applicant progress, application progress, and that applicant application progress bar will give you a list of everything that's happening during the process. So that's another place that you'll be able to go and it will tell you that in fact your application has been submitted. Our families are always very excited and they want to make sure that they've done what they need to do. So this is their way of knowing that they have access to this acknowledgement through their parent portal. And so, so they can find it in two ways to find out that they and verify that they've completed the application. So you'll receive an email, both, mm -hmm. the, both the parent and the student based right. upon the email address that you the student and has entered into the system, along with that they'll be able to go to that application progress mm -hmm. bar, uh, which is a tab across the screen, and, and, right. and you'll get it once you log in, but you can actually see the, the, the completion and the submission at that point in time. Mm -hmm. So there's two ways that we're identifying and, and verifying for parents. To make it easier for the parents and yeah. the students, yeah, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Here's the slide that um, the bottom is where the actual application is housed. And as you can see here, it becomes available at 8 a.m. on February 1st. And going back to our steps, students, you need to be the one that logs in first, and then the parent will follow. Uh, once, you, once you get into the application, this is the very first screen you will see. And it is merely asking you if you're a student or a parent, because it's taking you a different direction depending upon your answer. All you have to do then is click Next, and it's going to take you to the actual login page. And as you can see, there's also a checkbox that asks if it's your first time signing in and it's for the non-FCPS students to go to. But from this point forward, both the parent and the student will come back to this login page every time they want to go into the portal. And, and would you recommend that they bookmark this page for the yes, future? Yes, definitely, definitely. You'll be back here a lot. Our application deadline is Friday, February 26th. You have four weeks to complete this process. The, once the math has been verified, to complete your part of the application, the student and the parent, truly is probably less than 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. You know, um, For FCPS parents, you will have even less to do because your information is pulled from the database at the school into our system. So you won't have much you will have to complete. Um, our out-of-county students and private school students will have more demographic information that they will need to provide to us. So it may take you a bit longer, but still certainly not longer than 10 minutes. We encourage you to complete this and submit your application as soon as you can so it's out of the way. There is a, um, a date of February 24th, the Wednesday prior to the deadline at 4 p.m. You will not be able to start a new application after that time. The reason for that is we want to make sure that our counselors, school contacts, have time to verify all of the math requirements and still give the families time to complete the application prior to the 4 p.m. deadline on Friday the 26th. So that's why that February 24th date is in there. So moving on, after you have completed the application, uh, and this is actually a question that has come up, is are the student portrait sheet and the problem solving essay a part of the application? Meaning, do I have to complete this um, prior to that February 26th deadline? And the answer is no. Uh, the February 26th deadline is for the, basically what we would call a registration deadline. Uh, that allows us to know who wants to participate on the test, um, 
And, and when I say test, I really mean uh, the, the student portrait sheet and the problem solving essay. But who wants to be a part of this application process? And it's allowing us to have ways in which we can communicate and start to collect some information from the student and from the individual school that they attend. So when we're looking at the administration components here for the um, student portrait sheet and the problem solving essay, this will be administered on Monday, March 15th. Uh, that is a Monday. Uh, traditionally, this would have been uh, administered on a, in a school. You would have selected a test site on a Saturday, but due to the ongoing um, implications of COVID and social distancing, uh, along with the, the delays in the return to school at this point in time, um, we have transitioned to a virtual administration of the student portrait sheet and a problem solving essay. Now you'll also notice on here uh, that we have um, a makeup or accommodations date of April 12th. Um, that's for a very small or select group of students based upon um, accommodation needs for the actual testing, uh, as well as for some students who have may, may have been sick uh, and may have some prearranged absences uh, on the Monday, March 15th. So the portrait of a graduate or the uh, um, we're asking students to exhibit um, skills and um, kind of process of the portrait of a graduate. Uh, and what you're looking at there uh, is um, a, a number of different ideas that uh, work with um, 21st century skills and our Fairfax County portrait of a graduate. And so there's a large number of things that we really want to be able to see how students uh, you know, are really progressing and, and able to um, exhibit these types of skills and attributes. And you can see there's a long list here, you know, from collaborator to innovator to problem solver. And these are, uh, within our process, are, are really evaluated through a series of short answer questions. And, and what we're looking for is how students are able to relate this to going to a school that focuses on science and technology. And I think it's really important to understand that this is unique to every student that the, student, the questions that are really going to be presented for these students are unique in terms of their responses to um, those individual students and their own personal experiences. And when we get into the problem solving essay, this is a math or science based problem with multiple variables uh, and multiple components that have to be resolved and solved. And so what we're looking from the student is actually a solution. We are looking for them to be able to solve the problem that's presented to them. Uh, and then they're also going to explain how they solve that problem. All of this is in essay format. And that's important to recognize that that's the case. Now, we will get some questions about prep and what we can do to kind of prepare. And in this aspect, a lot of this information is really difficult for you to do a, hard, a, a large level of prep. We really think uh, this is either you know, abilities and skills that the students have and, and are able to share kind of their experiences and, and their own knowledge. Uh, and so there's minimal prep that they would be able to do as they go through that process. Jeremy, um, will the students have a time restrictions on this in this virtual environment? Yes, so in, in this particular process, um, there will be a timing element. So when we set this up on, um, on either date, depending upon which one the mm -hmm. students are, this, these are time-restricted uh, administrations. And what we mean by that is, is that there, we will actually send out information to the students about what that start time is going to be and what the end time is going to be for each um, section. Uh, so there will be a section for the, uh, the problem solving, or I'm sorry, for, yes, for the problem solving essay, mm -hmm. but also for the student portrait sheet. And it, it'll actually go in the reverse order. It'll start with the student portrait sheet and it'll be followed by the problem solving essay. Um, so students will have a limited amount of time, and that may be an accommodation depending upon what some students have. Right. Uh, and so, uh, but again, that is on that uh, on the Monday that we had just uh, talked about. So after the students really complete this portion of the application, there's not any additional information that they would be submitting to us. Um, so we'll transition then into a review process for all of those students that have applied. So we're going to look at their GPA that Linda mentioned uh, a short while ago. We're looking at that the GPA from the end of the year seventh grade marks and first quarter of eighth grade. It is a 3.5 GPA uh, as a minimum. We're looking at um, their, the student responses to each of the questions that are on the student portrait sheet, along with their response to the problem solving essay. Now one additional uh, bit of information that is included in the application process that will be that will be used, and it's new, uh, is some experience factors. And those experience factors are looking at those students who um, have um, 
uh, shown or not shown, but it's really what's impacting their, uh, their education is economically disadvantaged students, students who um, have special education needs, uh, along with students who are English language learners, and then from our historically underrepresented schools. And so all of this information really is going to come together to form the application packet for each of those students. So our selection process is going to go forward um, using only those elements. We don't include um, some of the former pieces where it was the, in previous years, we had admissions exams. Uh, we also previously had teacher recommendations and those parts are no longer a part of the process. But one of the, another new piece to this uh, that has been um, shared with the, from the school board is the 1.5%. And what that means is, is this is the top performers from at each public school will be offered admissions up to 1.5% of the student population uh, of eighth grade. So that's for our public schools. And that's provided that those students that ultimately apply meet minimum evaluation requirements based upon this holistic review. Jeremy, so how are private school students and homeschool students, how does this work for them? You know, that's a great question. Uh, and, and that's a question that we've been asked. So the 1.5 uh, percent is an allocation. So let's uh, let's talk about allocate what we would say is allocated seats and unallocated seats. So there's a, a portion of seats who are allocated to each of the individual public schools in this aspect. And so that's that 1.5 that we're mm -hmm. mentioning. That doesn't uh, doesn't make up the entire number of seats that we're going to offer to go to TJ. So our, our new target, which has actually increased, is now 550 students in the freshman class. And so at that point, we're not uh, offering all of our seats to the public schools. So there will be unallocated seats available to all applicants, both public school students uh, who were not offered through the 1.5, but also to our private school and our homeschool students. So they'll have an opportunity to be able to apply just like they have in the past and still have an opportunity to be selected. And again, this is looking at those students who are the top performers. So the top performers at each individual public school and then the top performers for the unallocated uh, as well as potentially if there are any unused allocated seats and meaning unused just that there you know, were maybe not students that had interest at TJ at that point in time. So when is all of this happening? And, uh, and it's a question uh, that frequently gets asked is, when does the application start? As we mentioned earlier, it opens up on uh, Monday, February 1st, uh, and it'll close on February 26th with the final submission. Uh, there is that other date that Linda had mentioned just previously about the February 24th, the application start date, uh, and the reasons why that goes along. But it's important to also know that we're going to go through this process uh, and we're going to have two dates of testing, uh, both our primary date and then our uh, accommodations or our makeup date. Uh, and that makeup date's April 12th. And as soon as we're done collecting and have all of our students tested and, and all of our materials collected, we'll be able to actually start the, uh, the application review process. And we'll start working on that process the following day. Uh, our expectation is we'll be able to release decisions uh, in June this year. Uh, and so we'll be relaying that information uh, throughout the application uh, through the system, really, uh, we'll be communicating with both the students and the parents as we go through that process. Uh, so one of the things that we wanted to do is we wanted to sit here and, and, and take an opportunity to be able to ask some questions or, or really answer some questions that, uh, that we frequently get. Uh, and so, Linda, we get some questions about residency, and I know um, specifically from a private school standpoint, um, do you, uh, can you address some questions or address some of the pieces about the residency and how that works for us? Absolutely. The first part of this whole process is, is residency. TJ, while a governor's school, is a public school, which means you must meet the public school residency. Um, for our public school students, their residency is proven by entering the system as a public school student. For our private school and homeschool students, when they go into the application, they will find um, a forms tab. And there they will find the uh, proof of residency for private schools. They will complete that online through the application and save it. And it actually then shows up in the system and as administrators, Jeremy and I can go in and we approve that residency. So that's how we handle that for non 
public school families in that process. So, so what type of documentation are we looking for? We're looking for a lease deed or mortgage statement, a utility statement, and here again, these are uploaded through the system, as well as um, a bank statement or a mortgage statement. So there are different documents that can cover each of three categories that are required to be, to be met. Okay. Um, and when Linda talked earlier about um, how we start the application and what we're doing, it's really important that the students are the ones that are applying uh, because they're the ones that are ultimately taking the, the or completing the student portrait sheet and the problem solving essay. Uh, parents, we want you to be included and you are included in this process, but we think that it's important for the students to actually start that application. That doesn't mean that mom or dad, you can't sit um, right beside them as they're starting to enter that information in. Uh, it doesn't mean that you can't be helping guide them along the way of what email address that you want to use or have included as part of that parent communication. I think those are vitally important questions and, mm -hmm. and a part of the process. Uh, but going through this, it really is important uh, for the students to start it. And we're not asking them um, questions that they really should have a difficult time. It really is some very basic information and you know, what's your address, what's your, your, your email address, your, your phone numbers, things of that nature as you go through. It's only seven pages, um, but it's very little uh, or minimum information. Um, so we've recently, and we talked about uh, the problem solving essay as along with the student portrait mm -hmm. sheet. So I wanna re-emphasize this because this has been a question that has come up a number of times mm -hmm. for us. That is not a part of the actual application. Um, at least on the initial phase. Uh, and that's why we wanted to reemphasize this is that's not something that they have to be concerned about on the front end. We really just want you to start the application so we can identify who all is going through this process and we can start that communication process with you and let you know what that is. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about the holistic review and, and how that kind of works from a very high level uh, in terms of weighting and, and how we look at everything? Absolutely. Well, there is no weighting to any of the components. It is looked at holistically, which is a process we've been using for several years now. Um, so that really has not changed. And we think that's important. Um, also, there's no weighting given to the grades in your GPA because it would not be equitable for, for schools who do not offer honors courses or a higher level course to um, be disadvantaged. So all, all grades are not weighted in that process as a part of it also. And so as part of the uh, holistic review, we look at all the components and this is done not by us. Um, the superintendents nominate evaluators, educators to participate in this process and so we have readers that will come in and they will be doing the evaluations um, uh, for all of these components. So that means that there's more than one person that's evaluating the application. Mm -hmm. So we have multiple people that are reading all of these applications and it's the full application information that the students are submitting from the grades to the student portrait sheet and the problem solving essays. So all of those components are brought together uh, and evaluated and finally it's the strength of your application um, that is evaluated within this process. And so that's what we're really looking at is these components that we shared with you. Uh, you know, there's a lot of questions that are out there. There's a lot more questions that we may not have answered today. Uh, and we certainly want to be able to assist you and help you as you go through that process. Please reach out to us with your questions. Um, the best way to reach us would be tjadmissions at fcps.edu along with calling us at 571-423-3770. Uh, and we wanna thank you. We know that um, currently in the world, it's been a very trying time as we're, we're going through all the impacts with, uh, with COVID and it certainly has been impacting us as well. And we wanna thank you for uh, your patience with us as we've made this transition in our application process. And we're really excited to be a part of this journey with you as you consider TJ as your high school option. Linda, thank you so very much for joining me today as we, we reach out and share some information about the application process. Uh, and I just wanna thank you guys all very much. And we wish you all the very best. Absolutely. Good thank luck. you very much. Good luck.